everybody and welcome. My name is Jelika Prsnik and on behalf of the Young Giver Committee, I wish to thank you all for joining us here today on our official launching uh, next neuro webinar series. Uh, this web webinar will be recorded, uh, so please feel free uh, to send your questions to a Q&A session. Um, at Ibro, we think it is really important to further engage the next generation of enthusiastic and proactive Ibro alumni across the world who resonate with Ibro mission. Therefore, I ask you to work together to give back to the community being guided by Ibro's mission to promote collaboration throughout the world while implementing Ibro's core values such as diversity, equity, inclusion, integrity, quality, and sustainability. Therefore, I encourage young PIs and mid-career scientists all over the world to join our initiatives and share with uh, us your ideas how to further contribute to our common goals. Thank you. Now, our uh, young Ibro representative from US Canada, um, Dr. Arjun Krishna Swami from McGill University will introduce our first speaker, who is not only excellent emerging neuroscientist, but brilliant example of Ibro's core values. Arjun. All right, thanks, Jelica. Um, okay, I guess we should get started. It's my pleasure to introduce Tom Baden, who is a young investigator at the University of Sussex in the UK. Um, the the theme of Tom's research is to understand how small groups of neurons arranged in circuits encode the sensory world with a focus on the visual world. Now, Tom got his start as a graduate student in the University of Cambridge, where he investigated the way that neurons in the zebrafish retina called bipolar cells filter the, the kind of photon evoked signals produced by photoreceptors. Um, Tom then followed his interest from fish to mouse, moving from Cambridge to Tübingen where he postdoc under Tom Soiler and produced a beautiful series of papers um, in which he presented um, the mouse retina with a complex set of stimuli and imaged the responses of all the various kinds of neurons in the retina, including the output cells called ganglion cells, and then used computational methods to cluster these cells together um, into different functional types. And it really gave us great insight into the kind of signal the eye sends the brain. Um, goes without saying, these papers have been published in a number of excellent journals, including uh, in Nature, Current Biology, Scientific Reports, Nature Neuroscience, many others. Um, I should say that Tom is also heavily involved in outreach, having started a charity um, called Teaching and Research in Natural Sciences and Development for Africa, or TREND, which runs cutting edge biomedical training courses, organizes volunteers, um, provides universities with scientific equipment, and it also goes without saying that Tom has won a number of prestigious grants and awards, uh, including the Nature Tencent Global Impact Award, a Young Investigator Award from Eppendorf and Nature, um, as well as funding from the Wellcome Trust and the ERC. So uh, we're all uh, delighted to have you here today, Tom. So let's uh, give him a warm virtual welcome. Uh, we're all looking forward to your talk. All right, well, thank you both very much for the uh, invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, let me just share my screen, see if I can get that right. Okay, hopefully this should be working. Maybe I can minimize this. Okay, so I'm assuming this works now. So yes, thank you again for the invite. Um, I'm very much delighted to give this talk to uh, such a diverse audience and also as the, as the I understand, first speaker in this series, which is uh, very exciting. So um, today I thought I used the opportunity to pull together a little bit what we've been doing in the lab over the past few years um, in order to try to synthesize this. That means for visual systems, not just in the fish, which is the one that we study specifically, but more generally, perhaps our own eyes. Um, so let me just jump right into it. So it's all about color vision. So this will, it's all about color. And so the question, of course, then becomes what is color? And as I am sure most of you um, are acutely aware, is uh, color is basically. 
um, the ability of animals to tell apart different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the entire electromagnetic spectrum is very broad, it starts from cosmic rays, goes all the way to radio and broadband uh, signals. Um, and a tiny fraction of that happens to be of the right energy levels that it can interact with biological molecules, in particular with opsins. And we have some of these opsins in our eyes. They respond roughly to this wavelength range of light. And this is why we call this the visible light. So it's something between 400 and 700 nanometers. So if I just take this now, and I were to plot what in uh, old world monkeys uh, are the spectral sensitivities of the three types of cone photoreceptors. So those are the, um, the, the, the main photoreceptors that we use for daylight vision. Um, then there is the one that we call the blue because it's sensitive in what we call the blue, visi blue visible part of the spectrum. Then there's the green one and the red one um, named for the same reasons. Um, and based on these three cones, we can generate spectrally opponent signals and spectrally non-opponent signals. And the latter of which um, might look something like this. You might have the blue, the green, and the red cones somehow be wired together in a sign conserving manner. That gives you a spectral tuning function that's some sort of sum of them. And therefore it will tell you about the brightness, the amount of light that is there uh, in a stimulus. But it doesn't particularly tell you about the uh, wavelength of the light because you can just change the wavelength and the intensity at the same time and compensate for the change in wavelength. Um, so this is what we would call an achromatic uh, system. And a large number of circuits in the retina and in our brains are of this nature. Um, but on top of those, we also have spectral or chromatic circuits. Um, the main one that we often consider is what we might call a primary color signal. And that one actually ignores the blue more or less. Um, and it takes the green and the red and it puts them against each other, one positive, one negative. It exists both way around. Um, that gives you a spectrally opponent signal and that is basically the basis of what we would call red green color vision in our own visual system. And then we've got the, what we might call a secondary color, which uh, then takes red and green together to form effect effectively yellow. Compare that to the blue one in much the same way this was compared. Um, and then you get yourself a blue versus yellow axis. So out of this, we basically have what we call trichromatic color vision. We have no zero crossing, one zero crossing, and actually two zero crossings. This one crosses again, it just doesn't show up very well here. Um, and the idea there is that this is an efficient representation of natural systems. Um, and this has been uh, studied quite intensively, including at the level of uh, psychophysics, for example, and it, it seems to hold quite well in our own eyes. Um, it is also then therefore the reason that whenever you think of color in a human sense, uh, for, for, for example, technology, um, that we always think of red, green, blue values, the RGB values, right? In a, in a digital image, you would have a red, green, blue value or in a, in a digital camera in the same way on screens, everything works in three spectral channels. And this is all very good. Um, however, if you look slightly more broadly across vertebrates, three is actually not the most common number of photoreceptor types, cone photoreceptor types that you might find in the retina. Four is a much more common theme, especially a lot of fish have four. And one of those fish is the zebrafish. And this is why we study the zebrafish because we want to understand how this system works. Now, how do you even begin relating them? So what we've done here is we've uh, just sort of extrapolated a simple phylogenetic tree of all the vertebrates with the origin here in the Cambrian and then all kinds of different uh, types of vertebrates um, diverging at different times over evolutionary history. And then here we've got the old world monkeys, or apes in this case, um, um, with their cone photoreceptor complement. We've got the zebrafish um, as an example of bony fish. Um, and then we can start guessing, okay, so how do these photoreceptors relate to these photoreceptors? And as it turns out, they're actually really quite old, um, the origin of these photoreceptors. You can trace them back to before the vertebrates diverged. And the reason that we can do that is because we've got some uh, species of, especially of, of jawless fish that have pretty much the same complement, uh, at least in parts as for example, the bony fish and indeed as we do. 
And because they diverged in the early Cambrian, basically as soon as vertebrates existed, they started to diverge. Um, that means that there must have been a common ancestor that had a photoreceptor complement, something like this. And then the only thing conceptually that you need to do to go from these ancestral 500 million years ago to what we have in bony fish today is you need to take this guy and you need to duplicate it um, in order to form what is today known as the rod for the receptor, which is the one that is very sensitive to light and is traditionally associated with vision at night and um, a green photoreceptor, right? So this is, they carry a, a similar pigment, RH1 in the rods and RH2 in the ancestral green cones. So this is what basically fish still have, is really old and there's not much change in the, in the fundamental uh, complement of what is in these photoreceptors. Um, now, what we can then do is we can look at these guys and we can compare them to these guys at a phylogenetic level. And what we'll find is that the original UV cone is still present in us. It's just, we call it the blue cone now. The original red cone is still present here. And then what we traditionally call the, red, uh, uh, the, the green cone in, in primates is actually just the second red cone. It's not equivalent to this green cone. And um, we know this is because mammals have lost both the blue and the green cone roughly around this time somewhere. And this was the time when the dinosaurs, this are the, the dinosaurs were dominating the planet. They were taking over most of the niches that mammals would otherwise want to inhabit. Therefore mammals were mostly small, mostly nocturnal. And there seems to have been a bottleneck process by which all mammals or all placental mammals anyway, lost these two middle cones, okay? And then out of that, we now have a, a very recent in evolutionary time gene duplication that uh, allowed this red cone to turn into what is now the, the human green cone, okay? Um, however, the mammal story isn't particularly ubiquitous in this way. If you look at other lineages, ah, yes, the duplication. So if you look at other lineages, for example, the amphibians, they didn't as a group lose anything. Instead, they actually had some sort of duplication involving the blue cone, the ancestral blue cone, turning it into a second blue rod, sometimes alongside the blue cone, sometimes without the blue cone. And of course, sometimes subsets of these um, photoreceptors are lost, but this is sort of the typical maximal complement, right? So here we've basically got a fish version plus an extra rod. Nothing has been lost. Um, similarly, in the birds, again, we've got a fish version, Plus what we've got extra here is what we call the double cone in the bird, which actually comes from the red cone. So again, all of these still have the ancestral complement plus sometimes a bit of extra stuff. Um, this extra stuff that they have is very poorly understood. Um, and I think it should be studied more, um, but let's just focus on the bony fish for now. And I just to finish the picture here, this is the sharks and the rays. And they've done something similar to mammals, except they didn't lose the blue and green cones, they lost the UV and blue cones. Um, and then most sharks actually lost the red cone as well. Anyway, so that means that across the vertebrates, the dominant theme is at least four ancestral cones, plus sometimes some extra things. Uh, and when I say the dominant, if you look at the species diversity, bony fish, amphibians, reptiles, and birds make up the vast majority of vertebrates in terms of species diversity. Uh, on the planet today. Yeah. Okay, so let us try to understand what is the big difference between the bony fish then and the apes. And that basically comes down to understanding what is it that these cones do in the fish, which we therefore no longer have and are presumably compensating for somehow. Now, the way to answer this is um, to directly look at the cones. So. As uh, many I'm sure are aware, the retina is organized in the layered structure. You've got what's called the outer retina. This is where the photoreceptors are talking to some laterally connecting neurons called the horizontal cells. They're also talking to bipolar cells. I will get onto that later. And the bipolar cells then project into the inner retina. That's the second major uh, layer of the retina where more processing happens. And I will talk about that then. So to fundamentally understand what's happening with the cones, we need to record directly from the cones. And importantly, we need to record from the synaptic output sites of these cones, because this is where they interact via the horizontal cells with the other cones. And if we do that, 
Um, uh, to do that, uh, we build a stimulator. I don't want to dwell exactly how it works, but basically the idea is that you've got lots of LEDs which are spectrally narrowed by bouncing through a diffraction grating. They're all being collected in a collimator. And then what you end up with is an effective stimulation spectrum that is much more narrow in spectral space than the opsins. And that means we can oversample the opsin space and get a tuning functions uh, as, a, as a function of wavelengths for pretty much any neuron that we can record from. Uh, this one was built by Philip Bartle in the lab, um, inspired by this paper from Belus et al. So, um, let me just drink. So here's the first experiment of this type, and you will see lots of experiments of this type done by Takeshi uh, in the lab here. Um, and basically what Takeshi did is he expressed GCAM, so a calcium biosensor with a synaptic tag, specifically only in the ancestral red cones of the fish. Um, then you can scan them. Each of these blobs is one synapse. Um, and then you can present a very simple light stimulus, basically flashes of light starting with deep red going to deep UV and get a tuning function. You can see it responds quite well here, not so well here, not so well here. Um, and then we can take this tuning function and plot it against wavelengths. Note that we've now flipped the y-axis because cones are off cells. They decrease activity when you switch on the light. So to compensate that, we flipped them in, in y. And I've actually also flipped it here in x because traditionally wavelength is plotted from short to long and we've start, we stimulated from long to short. So they double flipped. Um, so you get this curve and you can see it responds somehow at all wavelengths, but much more strongly here. Now we can do exactly the same thing for the three other cones. And this is uh, the very early punchline of this entire talk. If you look across, you've got one that doesn't cross zero. All of them go in the same direction. You've got two cones, specifically the green and the blue cones that do cross zero. They're strongly opponent in the long wavelength and then they're non-opponent in the short wavelength. Um, and then you've got the UV, which is basically like the red cone just responding in the UV range of the spectrum, okay? So you've got two non-opponent cones and two strongly opponent cones, importantly, with a non-identical zero crossing, okay? Now, um, this doesn't just happen once. These were single examples. These are uh, examples of large numbers of recordings for red, green, blue, and UV cones. You can see every time they do this, what is plotted here is the actual data with thin lines and the shading. And then on top of that, what is plotted is an opsin template. So this is basically the prediction of what the tuning function should be in each of these cones if there was no processing whatsoever. If it was literally taking the opsin expressed in the outer segment and translating that sensitivity function in an activity function of the neuron. And as you can see, the opsin fits fairly well for the UV cone. It fits fairly well for the red with some minor details that we can discuss later. Um, and it fits terribly for blue and green. And the reason it fits terribly is because of this opponency, which narrows here. And of course, the opponency per se cannot be predicted by an opsin because there's no such thing as negative light. So you cannot invert the polarity of a photoreceptor by giving it more light unless there's a circuit. Um, OK. so. Now, I told you that the uh, neurons, the, the, the suspect neurons that do this must be the horizontal cells because they're the only neurons in the outer retina that actually connect the cones. And we know that they tend to negatively couple one cone to the next. Um, so the obvious experiment now becomes you take out those, uh, those horizontal cells and we did that with pharmacology. And if you do that, it looks like this, right? So now again, the data, uh, in the, in the solid lines and the dotted line is what we had previously. And hopefully you can appreciate that if you take out the horizontal cells, there's absolutely nothing left to explain in these tuning functions. They are pretty much perfectly captured by the opsin. Yeah? So what that means or what we think this means is that you've got your four cones, they do exactly what they're supposed to do based on the opsin they express. And then you've got this horizontal cell network that um, wires them in such a way as to not strongly affect the tuning of the red and the UV cone, but to strongly affect the tuning of these two cones to make them opponent. Now, um, in order to understand how that's done, um, we need to know how the horizontal cells are wired. This was already worked out to some extent in the adult zebrafish, but because this is all lava, we did it again using EM. And the punchline is here, um, it's exactly the same. You have three types of horizontal cells. This is the H1, H2, and H3. 
the H1 horizontal cell connects to all of the cones, but it sort of dodges UV cones sporadically. So this connection is weak, whereas these ones uh, it basically catches them all when it can. Then you've got the H2, which catches pretty much everything that isn't red. So it's ignoring the red. And then you've got H3, which is strongly dominated by UV and has a handful of blue cones and never green and red cones. Okay. So our circuit then becomes this. You've got your four cones, you've got your three horizontal cells, and they're wired in this way. So then we wanted to understand how can we take in this particular network, how can we explain the difference between the horizontal cell removed tuning functions, which are shown here, and the horizontal cell non-removed, so the in vivo tuning functions, which are shown here. So this was work done by Cornelius Schröder in Philipp Behrens' lab, and basically he fitted a computational model to try to explain this. So this is what you show, what you see here now is with the horizontal cells not engaged. And then when you do engage the horizontal cells, then he managed to basically recapitulate all of the tuning functions. Note that the red and the UV are still more or less captured by, um, it's, there's not much change in red and UV, but there's pretty dramatic changes of the right nature in the blue and the green. So it seems that this network is definitely capable of generating this effect. But what's also quite elegant about this model that Cornelius wrote is that he didn't just recreate the effect that we saw, he also made a prediction. And he made the prediction that given that these cones are all wired in certain ways into these horizontal cells, these horizontal cells should have a specific tuning, um, just like the cones do. And the tunings of the horizontal cells that the model comes up with is this. It sort of says that H1 should be very broad, H2 should also be broad, but it should be biased to short wavelengths, and H3 should have this more complex function. These are already quite reminiscent of what we know happens in adults. Um, and we wanted to now check what happens in the lava. Uh, the way we did this is actually now, this is Takeshi's work again now, is with voltage imaging. So what Takeshi did here is he expressed the voltage indicator A sub 3 under connecting 55, which happens to be a thing that's in all horizontal cells. Um, and then you can get these responses from the cell bodies. And here are some example responses from single horizontal cells recorded in vivo in this way. Um, when you do this multiple times, you can cluster them again. And what you see is they fall into one large cluster that's very, very broad. Then you fall into a smaller cluster that's much more short wavelength biased. And then the third cluster that is even more short length biased. And it's hard to see, but it actually flips here a little bit. So if you plot them as tuning functions, um, this is our H1 cluster, H2 cluster, and H3 cluster. Here are the tuning functions. And now if we directly superimpose them on the model, the model now shown in solids, you can see it's pretty much the same thing. So this really makes it very elegant because it kind of tells us that we probably have understood not just the wiring of the circuit, we've, we've understood the entire synaptic architecture and the function and how, it's, how, it, how it operates as it does. Um, so we've got four cones with these tuning functions, we've got three horizontal cells with these tuning functions, and it all seems to work out quite parsimoniously. And if I may add, it's linear, right? So we don't need linear non-linearities to try to, to, to fit this model. Um, um, now, before I move on, I just want to have a little caveat. All of this done, all of this is done with full field stimulation, so big spots, not small spots. But of course, we know that the retina, including the photoreceptor layer already, has a spatial um, component to its response, right? So um, of course, this will still need to be looked at um, in the future with, with spatially restricted stimuli and see how it works then. Now, um, the big question now becomes, okay, great. So this is the circuit and these are the tuning functions. What's the point? Why are they the way that they are? And in order to answer this, I think the best way is if you go out into nature, you go out into the field and you basically generate spectral data in the way that the fish might be seeing it in their own habitat. So this is what we've um, done uh, already a few years ago. Um, this is work by Nora Nevala, um, was a PhD student at the time. Um, and basically what we did is we went to uh, Northern India here, um, which is one of the habitats of the zebra fish. They actually live all over this region. Um, and we found zebra fish in the wild. Um, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be a video, but the videos don't work very well. Um, uh, I'll show you this one later. Um, and we, we took footage with a camera, but of course, because the camera, as I mentioned in the beginning, only has red, green, and blue numbers, which are appropriate for human, it's no good for the fish. 
So in order to uh, make this useful for the fish, um, we built this device, which is what we call a hyperspectral scanner. And without going into the technical details, what it can do is it can scan um, a scene, a visual scene, for example, here this door uh, opposite our department. Um, and it can recreate a false color image um, where each pixel is now not just the red, green, blue value, but it's a full spectrum. Yeah. So these are full spectrum images. And the, um, uh, for example, you can see here that the blue door, artificially blue uh, painted door, has a very strong blue peak. And here, this brown red wall has a much more long wave shifted peak. Um, now, we can do exactly the same thing in the Zebrafish Natural Habitat. And we did this at the time, I put the data online. And then Philip later took that data from the natural habitat and he computed some statistics on this. And here's the first statistic of it this is just all of the spectra from 30,000 spectra. Um, all of them um, averaged, that normalized, and just to show the spread. And you can see that there's um, most light in this wavelength range, and then it sort of drops towards here and it drops towards here. There's a lot of variance here, not so much variance here. And variance is important because variance is where color information is to be had. Now, what we can do with this data is we can actually recreate what we think the fish might be able to see using its photoreceptors in nature. OK, so let's start doing this with the, with the simple case of the assumption that there's no circuit. So this is not just the opsins or the log opsins. Um, if you take this data and you convolve it with the red log opsin, you get this picture for this particular example scene. So what you can hopefully recognize is, for example, you've got this really bright reflective stone. You've got the ground with a bit of structure. Then you've got the, the, the upper water column with a bit less structure, the water surface. So you can sort of see how this matches. Um, basically telling us that the technique works. But then if you take the green one and you do the same thing, then the blue one and the UV one, the problem becomes is that all four pretty much tell you the same thing. Um, and that is, shouldn't surprise us too much because we know that spectral information in nature is correlated. Uh, and therefore, whatever you see in red, you'll probably also be able to see it in the blue and the UV. And the blue, and to some extent in the UV. So this is not an efficient way of communicating uh, spectral information. Whereas if you look at the actual tuning functions that we measured, and we do the exact same exercise, now the four uh, channels, or certainly the first three, become very different indeed from each other. So they tell you different information. So just by looking at these images, we can surmise this is probably more efficient than this. But if it, it doesn't really quantify how efficient it is. So one way of, to think about efficiency is to, to ask, OK, what is the best possible way that you could take this data and turn it into a small number of spectral tuning functions that maximally inform you about the spectral variance in nature? So how much color can you pull from this using not so many photoreceptors? Um, one way of doing this is to use principal component analysis, because that, it kind of exactly does that. It tries to explain variance using the smallest number of orthogonal components. So when we do principal component on this data, it spits out these first three principal components, one, two, and three, which together explain about 97% of the variance in the data, spectral variance in the data. Okay, PC1, two, and three look like this. And I hope that you can already spot this. It is really quite striking how PC1 is basically the same as the red cone, and PC2 is basically the same as the green cone. So it kind of suggests there's some pretty optimal spectral tuning going on here that gives you brightness information. And then once brightness information is accounted for, because that's what PCA does, it takes it out, then only color is left. And then the first color axis becomes what exactly is the green cone. And then the question is, what's the second color axis? And well, it turns out that if you combine your green cone and your blue cone in an opponent manner, so this is cone, so you take two opponent cones, you flip one, and then you combine them. Uh, with a certain weighting functions, you get pretty close to what PC3 is. Okay, so it seems that there's some sort of optimality here. And just to um, really hammer home just how good the system is, I just wanted to show you this, this new analysis we've, we've produced since we've put this um, bioarchive online um, to quantify this. So what you see here is the red cone tuning in red and PC1 in black. Let's ignore the yellow line for now. Um, they're quite similar. Um, what you can do is you can compute for every single uh, spectrum of the 30,000 that we had, how strong would this red cone respond to it um, on this axis, and compare that to how 
uh, to the loading of each spectrum onto a PC. So basically how strong the, uh, that spectrum activates the PC, right? It's, it's kind of the same thing as the activation of the red cone, um, except that it uses the PC as a spectrum. And what you can see is that this correlation is incredibly high. And it's not just incredibly high, it's actually above 0.999, right? So this is pretty much as close to optimal as you're ever gonna get with this kind of data. Um, but importantly, it is not just extremely strongly correlated here, it is also not at all correlated to PC2, and it is not at all correlated to PC3. And that's important because that means that the activity of the red cone is maximally informative about brightness, which is what PC1 gives you, but it's completely uninformative about first color axis or the second co uh, color axis, right? It's basically, it's not just a brightness signal, it's a clean brightness signal that is not contaminated by wavelength uh, opponencies. Now, um, then the yellow line here is just the control. It's basically a computational way of um, computing how good could the system possibly be if it had all options to combine its options. So it's what we call the opsin fit to the PC. So you take the four opsins and you um, combine them with linear weights um, in order to try to recreate this black curve. And then you do the same exercise as we've done with the red cone. And this is basically the biologically plausible optimum. And yes, the opsin fit is better than the red cone, but basically we're going from 0 0.999 to 0.9999999. So really this optimum is, this is good enough. Um, okay, so that's red cone. Um, we can do exactly the same thing as the green cone. Notice how perfectly they sit on top of each other, especially the zero crossing. And if we do the exact same thing for the green cone, now we get a perfect correlation, um, both for the opsin fit and the green cone for the second component, but no longer for the first and still not for the third. And that means that the green cone, and this is important, is not at all informative about brightness. If you just make your scene brighter in a naturalistic sense, um, the green cone will not respond, but it responds if you change it along a primary color axis. And again, it does not respond if you change it along a secondary color axis. So it's maximally informative about the primary color component in, these, in this data. And then finally, if you do your um, blue-green component, um, then that gives you a pretty optimal third one, which is not informative about the first two. Now, these two, I think, are pretty much bulletproof because they're directly measured in the retina. They're just what they are. This one is the assumption that somewhere downstream, there's an opponency between green and blue. Just put a pin in that. Now, but what that then really means, and let me just have some water again, is that the color vision system of the zebrafish is pretty optimal for giving you one grayscale image, which is represented in the red cones. The first, the primary color image represented in the green cones, possibly a second color image, which could be computed downstream, which would involve the blue cone. It also means that the UV cone is not used for any of this. And then the UV cone is basically another grayscale axis, but it is a grayscale axis that is maximally distinct from this one. Um, and it will highlight different features. And I just want to um, point out why it is useful to have two times gray, because it seems you could just merge them. And to some extent they're merged downstream, but I just want to point out there's quite a lot of stuff that you can do um, using non-opponent, but spectrally this very distinct uh, channels like this. So here is an experiment that uh, Takeshi did in a recent paper. Basically, we took a camera with a filter that's either um, UV or red. So we get a UV or red image or yellow, what we call election. This is actually yellow in a fish. Um, and then you put an aquarium outside, put some paramecia in there. Paramecia is fish food. Um, and in the sun, critically, we, you need natural illumination. And then you just filmed those paramecia and the background and everything. And I think this video doesn't work yet. So let me just quickly jump out. Um, maybe I can share the video because I think this one's actually quite nice. So like this, it should hopefully work and maybe you can see the video. So this is now the, the, the red, what the red cone sees and here's what the UV cone sees. And I hope you can appreciate just how different they are, first of all, but also second, the kind of different types of information they give. The red one basically gives you the, the image that you would expect if you turn this black and white. You see some rocks, you see the water surface, you see some bubbles. It's a great way of seeing the world from an achromatic perspective. It just gives you a black and white image of the world. The UV doesn't really do that. The UV gives you very little information in the bottom. 
a huge brightness gradient from top to bottom because UV scatters so much in the water. And then on top of that, and, and what, what that gradient does is it basically masks any background structure. So whatever you see in the UV has to be foreground. Um, and then on top of that, what you can see is all these little critters floating about, and those are the paramecia. So the paramecia are basically highlighting themselves in the UV channel because what's happening is the sun is bouncing off them, scatters, and then you get these little sparkles. So of course, if you're a fish and you're eating these, you want to see UV just like that, because then you can just pick out your food and you don't get distracted by the background. Um, let me just jump back to sharing the screen. Okay, so we're back here. So, uh, and just to show behaviorally that this is exactly what the fish do, this is now what Nora did again. Very simple behavioral experiment. Um, you put your fish in a dish um, and you give them some paramecia and you just watch them over time. Um, and you give them either UV light as illuminant or yellow light as illuminant. And then you just watch the fish, how often they make an attempt to eat the paramecia. And as you can hopefully see, they basically just do this when you give them UV light. Sometimes they do it when they give you yellow light, but when you superimpose this, it's a pretty dramatic effect. They greatly prefer the UV, okay? So this tells us that UV light is helpful for prey capture. But it's actually more than that, because what we can then do is we can genetically ablate the UV cones. So this is a perfectly normal fish. The only thing it doesn't have is UV cones. And then the difference goes away and the overall performance of the UV basically reaches the similar performance that you had in the yellow channel. So this means it's not just the UV light that is being used, it is the UV cones doing it, right? So it's not the blue cones catching the, the UV component, for example. Um, so UV clearly is at least in part for prey capture. Now, um, UV is actually better than just prey capture. And this is a fairly well-known effect actually that works above the water and below the water. Above the water, if you take red and UV pictures, and this is now from, from this Belusage paper here, um, UV basically gives you better silhouettes against the sky. And the key reason why this works is because it takes away the clouds. And this is also uh, the reason why you're gonna get sunburned even if it's cloudy. Clouds do not help you with your UV. You still get sunburned. And in case of vision, you just get your clear sky. And of course, that is helpful if you want to detect the trees, in this case, or a bird, right? Um, the same thing happens in water, just much more dramatically. So here, this is from a Cronin Bock review. They went and they took a picture underwater in the reef. Here's your red picture. Here's your UV picture. You can just see how much more silhouette these fish are. So of course, you want to have a red image because it gives you um, it's fundamental, this will always give you more information, but if you want to specifically look out for silhouettes against the water, then you do want to look at uh, the UV channel as well. Okay, so now um, let's jump into the downstream circuits. Okay, so this from the photoreceptors after horizontal cell interactions uh, connects to, cone, uh, to bipolar cells. The bipolar cells go from here to here into the inner retina, and we can then monitor them at the level of the inner retina, at the level of the synaptic terminals, which is where they talk to amacrines, um, which are laterally connecting neurons here, and ganglion cells, which eventually project to the brain. Now from adults, from this paper here and some others, we already know approximately how the different types of bipolar cells are wired to the cones. In zebrafish, there's something in the order of 20, and here's the wiring diagram that you can get. So there's one, at least one morphological type that directly varies to the, the red cones and no one else. There are two that directly wire to the green and nowhere else. That's already tempting because we know that this is a perfect achromatic signal and this is a pretty perfect uh, chromatic signal. So it's nice to keep them clean. But then on top of that, it basically makes a big mess of combining them. So the question then becomes, so what do the bipolar cells do as a population? In order to get that, we did pretty much the same experiment that we did for the cones with the imaging, but now we're imaging all of the bipolar cells all over the eye. Um, uh, to the same stimulus. Ah, oh, this again doesn't work. Let me just show you this video because it's quite nice, I think. Um, so this is a stitched together video of the entire inner retina, one plane of the inner retina responding to the stimulus. Different wavelengths, flashes of light. And you can see, you can get this on-off separation um, between the inner and the outer band. You can see this quite clearly um, here, for example. You can see it sort of wobbles back and forth between the on and the off layer. Um, and you can see that at different wavelengths, which are now different times in this video, different synapses come 
um, in and out of existence here. So clearly it's quite complex. Um, so to summarize this, um, what Philip did is he took the data from several thousand bipolar cell terminals and clustered them. In this case, he came up with 29 clusters. The exact number isn't so critical. Um, and then what you can do is you, and they're just sorted by depth in the IPL, so by depth in the inner retina. Um, and what you can see is that it's a big mess. There's a lot of stuff. And this slide is basically completely unreadable, um, at least this side. So what we've done here is we've just picked a handful of what we call representative bipolar cells just to illustrate the sort of things that you can see in a bipolar cell. So first of all, the simplest ones look like this. They're a little bit opsin-like, right? There's this sort of reminiscent of a red cone response. This is reminiscent of a UV cone response. Then some are broad, right? They don't really cross zero much, but they sort of just integrate lots of different systems. I, presumably you get multiple peak ones, but then it gets complicated. Then you get complex kinetics. For example, you've got very transient responses here. Um, and very sustained responses here, right? So wavelength and time information starts getting mixed. Um, that can look quite complicated sometimes. Then you get classical opponency, right? Response one way around here, one way around here, and with different zero crossings, here's another example. You can have opponency this way around, or you can have opponency this way around. Um, and then you can take all of these features and you combine them and you'll find a cluster that does it. For example, here is a opponent cluster with a temporal component that's really quite complicated. Now, um, what can we do with this? Well, if we wanted to summarize the data, make it a bit more simple, we can ignore all the temporal stuff and just sort of extract the bulk tuning function of this neuron as, well, as a function of wavelengths. And if you do this for all of the bipolar cells that are sort of in these top categories here, this is basically the picture you get. You get quite a lot of bipolar cells, many offs, some ons, that are broad, so they basically pool lots of cones, presumably. Then you get a handful that are UV cone-like. Um, then you get, uh, again, a handful that are red cone-like, as it happens they're all off in this case. Um, so these are sort of fairly simple uh, tuning functions still. And then you get three different flavors of opponency. You get this opponency, this opponency, and you get this opponency. And basically nothing else. And this is important. So if we now look at all of these together and just look where they cross zero, there's basically three places they cross zero. There's lots of them that cross zero here, which happens to be the place where the red and the UV cross. You get a handful that cross zero here where the blue cones cross, and you get a handful here that's where the green cones cross. So it's kind of tempting to say that you've got now a tetrachromatic system separating this zone from this zone from this zone from this zone. But I'm not sure it's quite that simple. Um, what is the point of generating this extra opponency here, right? So, so remember, these two opponencies, we already have them from cones. Probably they're just inherited. This is a new opponency. This doesn't really exist in cones. And it seems to be the most heavily done thing in the inner retina. So this is now taking your red cone and your UV cone and putting them together. But it's not putting them together straight. It's putting them together in opponency. So if we take these pictures and we compute an opponent picture, it looks like this. And the point is that the contrast is pretty good. You can use red cone opponency to pull out extra contrast, pull out information that is contained in both of these into a single channel. So this would be a powerful way, not just for possible UV based color vision, but actually to get contrast information. Now, um, let me just check my timing. I don't want to go, yeah. So I'm going to speed up a little bit and skip some bits just for timing's sake. So um, the easy prediction is that the greens would be somehow directly linked to the green cones. The blues might be directly linked to the blues, but there's no blue isolating bipolar cell. So probably some sort of canceling will need to happen. Uh, and then this must be a new opponency because it is not a, an opponency that is seen in the outer retina. Um, so how can we go from cones to bipolar cells? And I think this is the bit that I'm going to just brush over and you just have to take my word for it that what we can do is we can take the cone tunings, we can take temporal components that we've extracted from bipolar cells, fast on, slow on, fast off and slow off, and basically recreate any bipolar cell. Um, I'm not gonna go into the detail here now. This works really well. Here's just a bunch of examples. Um, you can create these complex kinetic situations, you can certainly create opponency uh, and anything in between. So this is the weights that this pulls out. And just to explain how you read this, if they are brown, that means they are sine 
conserving weights, um, meaning that the off from the off signal from the photoreceptor remains an off signal at the level of the bipolar cell. But of course, because the photoreceptors, some of them are opponent, it's not really an off signal anymore. So this is why we call it the conserved signal. Um, so the brown ones are all the conserved ones, and the pink, uh, the blue ones are all the inverted ones. So what we would traditionally call an on bipolar cell. Um, and hopefully by eyeballing, you can see a few trends. So the first trend that hopefully you can pick out is that red is the one that always has the heavy weights, both positive and negative, whereas green, um, blue and UV have smaller weights. So by and large, the inner retina is red cone input dominated, which makes sense because that's the achromatic channel and probably the most important one. Second, if you correlate your red weights against the green and blue weights, there is absolutely nothing interesting going on whatsoever. They are perfect, well, not they're strongly correlated. There's no new opponency between this and any of these cones. And that kind of that, that's kind of intriguing. That means that even though you could quite easily take, say, the red cone and oppose it to the green cone for whatever reason, the fish doesn't do it. The fish just keeps red, green, and blue together. But what it very readily does is it flips your UV relative to red, which then also means UV relative to these two. Yeah. So three big take home messages of the inner retina. Red is the most important. Red, green, and blue do the same thing. And red and UV do not do the same thing. New opponency is all about the UV cone. So how is this all built? Well, one way to look at this is to just look where in the inner retina do we see which kind of signals. So we know that off bipolar cells stratify in the upper part of the uh, inner plexum layer and on bipolar cells anatomically stratify in the bottom part. So if nothing interesting at all is going on, we expect on signals here and off signals here. And this is exactly what you see in, if you just look at the UV code weights. UV off signals up here and UV on signals are down here. However, if you look at any, and so that means this is pretty much a situation for UV. However, if you look at any of the other ones, you do not get this. You still get the off signal in the top here, but you also get quite a lot of off signals in the wrong bit. Yeah. So what this means is that by and large, the way that this red versus UV cone opponency is built is by taking red, green, blue cone circuits, which are supposed to be on, but they're not on, they're off now. Uh, yes, that way around. And you're taking them and probably putting them into the, into the uh, UV on cone bipolar cells with a sign inversion. Uh, so something like crossover inhibition. So with an amacrine cell. So that's the idea. Now, um, jumping on from bipolar cells, The next thing that happens is ganglion cells. Ganglion cells are incredibly complicated. We've scanned them. I just want to show you some examples here. Um, uh, we haven't finished the analysis, so I just want to show you tell you the punchline. As far as we can see, ganglion cells copy bipolar cells and just do whatever the bipolar cells do better. So they get sharper, they get faster, they get more nuanced, but they don't really invent new opponencies as far as we can see. Um, I may have to eat my words on that uh, a few months down the line. Um, so I'm just going to ignore the ganglion cells for now, and I want to jump straight into the brain. And this is now the simplest overview that we can generate over the brain. So this is now imaging lots of large numbers of neurons across the brain observer fish. And here I'm just showing the simplest way I can. Um, this is all of the on responses that we recorded from a bunch of fish superimposed in an anatomical way. So this is, for example, the tectum. And then you see you get some responses outside the tectum as well. Uh, as a function of wavelength. And what you can see is you get a lot of on signals in the UV. You don't get many on signals in the greens, the blues, well, or the greens anyway. And then you start getting them again in the reds. Okay, so you get a tuning function that looks like this, the gray one here. Um, the UV component is an almost perfect copy of the UV cone, which kind of suggests that the UV cone goes straight wired into the brain um, from a sort of functional point of view. Um, this red curve is not well explained by the red cone. The red cone is this one and the red curve is here. It would be quite well explained by the green cone or some sort of combination of red and green. Next, if you do the exact same thing and just looking at the off responses, now you get a nice tuning function that is not very complicated at all. You don't get very much in the UV anymore, you get everything else. And that tuning function is quite reminiscent both of the red cone and also of PC1. So it's almost as if the off response in the brain is your achromatic 
baseline. And then the final thing you can do is you can take your on and off and compute what would be the on off filter. So the, the combination of both. And that looks like this. And finally, this is now the bit that looks approximately like the opponency between the blue cone and the green cone that we've been missing in the retina. So perhaps the second color channel is being built in the brain and we're, we're working on that now. Now, other than this being a possibly interesting coincidence, we just wanted to understand what does it actually mean if you've got a dominant on-off response that is so complex in nature. And this is just a very simple point. If you look underwater at an object that is far away, you will not be able to tell if it has any color. And that is because light gets increasingly monochromatic with distance. So that means that if, a near, if an object is colorful underwater, it has to be nearby, it cannot be far. So you could just use the property of colorfulness as a proxy, as a very simple shorthand for guessing that something is nearby. Um, here's this effect illustrated. Um, the same species of fish further away and closer, and this one you can see the orange here, you can't. I would point out that this is not a specific water feature. It happens on the land, but it happens much over much larger distances. So this is what uh, it looks like near campus where we work. You can see the greens in the front, but with the haze, you basically just get grays in the back. Right? So you get the same effect. It's just it's not as useful because obviously those hills are far away. Um, now, just to see if that actually works, um, we again took the hyperspectral data that I introduced in the beginning, and we just looked at a featureless scene. So there's nothing at all going on here. This is your on and your off response in the brain. Nothing interesting at all going on. And if you compute the contrast, again, nothing interesting at all going on. And then we injected fake UV green and, uh, uh, and red objects into the spectra and computed the same thing again, right? So you can see here, you can sort of make them out in the on and off channel, but it's hard. But then if you compute the contrast, they really pop out either as brighter than background and as darker as background. So basically all three colors are being accentuated in the contrast channel. So it basically tells you there is color, but it doesn't really tell you what the color is, if that makes sense. Uh, and just to point out that this actually works if you take a cluttered scan with stuff in the front, so where there's some color information to be had, then your on and off channels are less informative about scene contrast uh, content than your contrast channel. So maybe there's something in this that this complex tuning function gives you something like a distance estimation. If this tuning function is being activated, something has to be nearby. So that's just a little dirty trick you can use for color that is sort of different from traditional color so that then leaves us at a picture that looks a little bit like this. Um, you've got a UV system that is mainly undominated. It's probably quite heavily dominated by the need for prey capture. You've got a red system that is both on and off dominated. Uh, well, it's not dominated, it's, it's more or less balanced. And balanced is what you kind of want when you want a good achromatic vision, which gives you brighter and darker than background scene information. But that only really works in the red. Um, and then if you look in the green, that gives you the place um, you, you're basically lacking your off responses, but it gives you a nice baseline against to which compute a spectral contrast against red and against UV. So the, the color information is still there, if that makes sense. So this now comes to the very final bit. And now I'm going a little bit over time, but I just wanted to sort of uh, close it with, with some thoughts here. So this is then kind of the picture that we see in fish. And I know this diagram is a little bit complicated, but it's, it should hopefully be quite digestible if you just look at the output here. So you've got some achromatic channels, black and white, broadband, which are easily explained by just pooling all the cones. You've got some red channels, which are easily explained by just going to the red cone. You've got some UV channels, which are easily explained by just going to the UV cones. And then you've got three types of opponent scene signals. The, the simple ones are easily explained with just the green cone. These ones are explained possibly by combining green and blue, possibly in the brain. And then finally, this one um, is explained by crossover inhibition at the level of bipolar cells. And we might call that a tertiary color channel. Now, um, when fish then further evolved and eventually we got the first land dwelling animals, especially the mammals, the mammals then lost as begin in the beginning these two cones and therefore they lost these two circuits. And then what that means is what they're possibly left with is something like this. You still have your achromatic, you still have your red biased and your UV biased, and you still have this, what the fish might call their tertiary color. The, the, the mammals, the early mammals might now call their primary color. 
So it seems there's some sort of color vision in this early circuit left over, but it's not the color vision that the fish use, which is generated in the outer retina. Um, and the other problem with this particular thing is that this is where your color crossing is. Um, but in nature, the highest spectral variance is not down there, it's up here. So that means this is not well positioned in order to give you what we would traditionally think of as color information. However, it is incredibly well positioned to give you this contrast enhancement that I was talking about. So I just want to uh, very briefly show a video um, from uh, Yongrong here in Thomas Euler's lab. Oh, this actually works, this is good. Um, what they did is they built a camera that takes UV uh, video and red video at the same time. Of red in case is green for the mouse. Yeah, it's just the red, uh, the ancestral red cone. Um, and you can see um, both give you some sort of information. The red is a bit uh, fuzzy. The UV is quite sort of sky subtracting and all of that. Uh, and both are quite useful. But really where the power comes is when you combine them in an opponent way with either UV dominating or with red dominating. You start to really pull out the contrast in these scenes. So it's almost to say that, yes, of course, the mouse can discriminate wavelength from intensity, building something like color vision. But is it trying to see color? Or is it trying to build a contrast enhanced image that's actually uh, behaviorally critical? Um, now, um, just a little side point that I think is quite interesting. If you look at the timeline of when the mice uh, or when the early mammals lost the, uh, these two cones, it was actually before the evolution of angiosperms, so flowering plants. So what we traditionally in nature now consider colorful objects, fruits and flowers and things like that, hadn't evolved yet. So maybe at that time, the mice didn't have particularly strong drive to actually need these, even if they could see them, because there was nothing to be seen. Um, and maybe therefore, and uh, the sort of vegetation that was around was mosses and ferns and that sort of thing, so very green, browny things. So maybe the spectral statistics were different at the time. Um, so finally then, so if this is our mouse, and then we finally evolve into something that we might call a new, an, an old world monkey, um, what the old world monkey has uh, now duplicated this red cone, and therefore it presumably keeps all of these circuits that the mouse has, um, and it invents a new one. And the new one is what it would now call the primary color, because this one is now in the red region of the spectrum, so more useful. But the problem is, that the red cone and the not quite red cone, which we call the green cone, are molecularly almost identical to the point where the circuits in the retina have no way of knowing, am I talking to a red cone or am I talking to a green cone? So the only way to really read this out is by what the primates have is the midget pathway, which is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one connectivity from cones to bipolar cells to ganglion cells. So basically, if you only ever connect to one cone, of course, you are either a red circuit or you're a green circuit. But the problem is it just pushes the problem into the brain. So clearly we can see or discriminate red and green contrasts, but we don't really do it by a particularly elegant retina mechanism. It is something that the, the brain seems to solve for us. Um, so what we consider red and green color vision is not really easily linked with what the fish might consider that particular computation. Um, so here's is where the new primary color sits for the primates. So maybe this uh, starts to converge into something that, uh, that makes some sense. And then of course, given that this is now available, this becomes what, uh, what we might consider the secondary color. Uh, and I should point out that the primates have also moved up the UV cones, so they're much more blue now, which makes them more useful in this context. Um, now, uh, wouldn't it be nice to know what the circuit is for this? Um, and I don't have an answer of what the circuit is, but um, I just want to point out that this cone duplication type thing is not so unique to us. So first of all, birds have done something like it. So maybe understanding how this double cone is wired would be quite an interesting thing. Um, and also there are some other examples and just this one example I want to point out, there are some species of cut, like, well, it's called the elephant shark. It's basically a very early type of shark. It's not really a shark, it's a redfish. Um, and they have duplicated, just like the apes, um, the red cone. So maybe if we could study these guys, we might learn something about how this can be integrated if you duplicate your cone much, much earlier. So with this, I just want to leave you and show you a picture of an elephant shark because I think they're funny. Um, and I want to thank all of the people involved in the work, which is all of the lab, in particular Takeshi and Philip on our side, and then Cornelius and Philip on, uh, on the tubing side and our funders, and I want to thank you all for your attention. And again, I apologize that I've gone a little bit over.
Thank you. All right, Tom, thanks for a, a really wonderful talk. Um, really beautiful looking data, so cool. Um, I guess we have uh, a few questions. I certainly have some. Um, Jelica, I guess I'll just go through the question box first, or uh, are you gonna add some speakers to raise hands or how does this? Yes, please, Arjun, uh, please start with the questions and anybody who wants to ask questions, just please uh, follow instruct instructions in chat uh, box. Raise your hands and we will let you in. Okay, so Tom, there's a, there's a question in the, uh, in the question box about uh, clustering. So how kind of a, a methods question. So how, how you classify uh, horizontal and bipolar cells and how those um, criteria are established to define the minimal number of clusters or the maximal number of clusters, like that sort of thing. Yeah, so that's always a tricky one. So for the horizontal cells, it's quite easy because the heterogeneity in the data is quite low. Um, so it's quite obviously three. If you use um, what's called a Bayesian information criterion or Akaike information criterion um, or silhouette values, it basically tells you it's three. Um, mm -hmm. So then uh, just finding the three isn't so hard. For the bipolar cells is a much more tricky question. Uh, I believe the model that we settled on in the end is a mixture of Gaussian model. Um, I'm pretty sure Philip used the Bayesian information criterion. I'm sure he will correct me if he didn't. Um, so this, this is sort of our standard way of deciding. Um, okay. And yeah. I'm not saying there's 29 types of bipolar cells. I'm saying there's 29 signatures that we happen to distinguish using this particular method. Sure, sounds, sounds reasonable. I, um, I, I, I might jump in with a question since I don't see another immediate one, but maybe Jelica has more. Could you, uh, could you say something about the distribution of opsins of photoreceptors in the fish eye? Is it, is it uniform? Maybe I missed that. Um, um, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, this is something I've sort of put aside for this particular talk. So um, many animals, including zebrafish, uh, have an asymmetric retina, um, uh, which is uh, observable in pretty much anything you look at the eye, the structure of cells, the number of cells, what they express, etc. So opsin expression is one of these features. Uh, zebrafish don't actually just have the four opsin, but they have, well, they've got more than four. Let me not get the number right. I think it's seven maybe in six, um, and there is regional variations amongst them. But the thing is that the different opsins that the fish has, the zebra fish, which are expressed in the eye, are spectrally quite close to each other. Um, so they don't make a huge difference for the tuning. However, having said that, we do have regional data for the photoreceptors and there are some differences. But what's quite interesting is that the main differences are in line with what you would expect in nature. So for example, the um, spectra of the photoreceptors looking up, so at the skylight where it's the brightest, they're narrower, presumably trying to not get saturated. Whereas if you look at the ground, they're broader. So mm -hmm. yes, there are tuning differences, but they are actually in the direction that seems to make sense. Sure. So then the way the way to maybe think about the the red UV opponent uh, idea is that you know that. That might get somewhat sharper as you you move downwards i suppose it might yes i think this is something we'd have to look carefully at the problem with our hyperspectral data which would i guess be the way to look at this is that it just takes 60 degree um and really the big variations are 180 degree so we, we'd have to expand that uh-huh um okay there's another question that's come in here um do you have an explanation uh, for the double cone arrangement in zebrafish and other teleos? L and M cones <laughs> come in fused pairs, but M is molecularly closer to rods in brackets, or is it just the opsins? I, I'm sure you can see these questions. Um, yeah, no, I think that this, this is puzzling. So I think the first confusion is that we talk of double cones in fish as if they're somehow equivalent of double cones in reptiles and birds. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's correct. I think the reptile and bird ones are related to the, to the LWS uh, cone lineage, uh, whereas the double cones in fish are 
actual green cones and actual red cones becoming friends, if that makes sense, right? So the, the, the way to get to these um, double cones is different. Um, you can actually see this quite nicely in zebrafish because in the larval zebrafish, you would never call them double cones because they are independently arranged and they're only sort of arranged in their neat mosaic where this double structure in the adult, right? So it's, I think it's a different mechanism between the birds and the fish. Um, and at that point, I think it makes a huge amount of sense to have twice as many red and green cones compared to blue and UV cones because, well, they they give you the optimal signals for brightness and for uh, and for color, for primary color anyway, under the assumption that the adult ones do what we see in the larva. That's another thing to check. Um, and then it, it kind of becomes a little bit like what we do in technology. I don't know if you, um, if you think about how a camera chip works in a, in a red, green, blue, like a color camera, um, you have always pixels of four pixels, right? It's one, two, three, four, and then that's a repeating unit. And in those, there's always red, green, green, blue. So you're doubling the green. And the reason that you're doubling the green is because most light exists in the green and engineers know this and therefore they've sort of doubled up on that. Now the fish kind of does the same thing. It just doubles up on the red green cones because they're presumably the most efficient. Hmm. Oh, fascinating. Um, maybe as we wait for another uh, question, uh, Jelica, you'll keep me on time, right? I'll, I'll just yes. keep asking Tom yes. all day. We are still on time. Uh, I wanna tell you, thank you Tom so much uh, for this amazing talk. And I can tell that I will never look at my um, fish tank the same way after your talk. So <laughs> the most impressive was uh, for me that without uh, UV cones, uh, fish are not good at catching prey. Really, so I learned a lot from uh, your talk. Now I can see that we have some new questions. So uh, Arjun, would you be so kind to? Yeah. There's uh, one about horizontal cells uh, in color opponency. And the question is an uh, experimental one about whether you tried to manipulate the uh, horizontal connection uh, to cones and uh, check behavioral effects uh, as a result. Wouldn't that be nice? So the problem, the problem with horizontal cell, uh, horizontal cells in general is there's no way that I know of currently in which you can genetically target just the one without also targeting the others. So we can take all horizontal cells out and then do behavior tests, absolutely. And I think that's something worth doing. Um, but we can't just take out, for example, the H1, which would in our case be quite interesting because that would predict that then maybe all the color stuff goes away, but maybe some other stuff doesn't. Um, although I'm not sure you would behaviorally test if they see color um, is hard. Um, but yeah, so something like this would be very, nice to do is just we haven't got the tools actually what is starting to become possible is at least we've got targets now because in the chicken transcriptome published by josh saint's lab um there are three horizontal cells plus the rod one so the fourth one which the fish also have i ignored that uh here in this talk um so they have three targets so now we can start trying to hit them and see if we can get individual horizontal cell types and that's pretty much as far as we are okay Cool. There's a um, there's a question about projections to the brain. Um, do do fish have uh, an analog of the lateral geniculate uh, complex? And uh, what what about color vision in that area? I think maybe the the person asking the question is thinking about K pathway type stuff. Right. So this this is a where it gets hazy. So first, so fish don't have something obviously uh, homologous to, to to the LGN. Um, everything in the fish goes to the tectum, which I guess would be the SC in a mammal. Um, what is worth noting is that in mammals, the SC does receive the vast majority of ganglion cell inputs. It's just some of them also go to the LGN, uh, which is then the pathways that we consider as the, the dominant ones, the midgets and the parasols and the, the coniocellular pathway. Um, now, what we consider in the primate as a, as a key spectral channel is the blue-yellow one. Um, which seems to come from the bull, in part from the small bistratified cells, which go into the LGN. What I don't know actually from the top of my head is if they also go to the SC. So that would have to be checked. And what I certainly don't know is to what extent you will find anything even remotely like these cells in a fish. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, a key question that we will still have to answer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it'd be very interesting. Yeah, seem, I mean, the, the imaging from Tectum, I guess that was 
maybe whole brain imaging? I mean, you're in a good position to, to address some of those questions. Yes, yes. Um, but I, th I think in order to really find the homologous cell types, you want to do it genetically, and that just takes time. Sure. There is a, um, a question about uh, inferring distance using color information, which I found fascinating as well. Um, and do you think it could induce a coevolution? Do you think there's a coevolution uh, within the predators, perhaps of the zebrafish, um, trying to change their colors to, or I guess, I guess it would be the other way around, paramecium who have changed their colors uh, to evade the, the zebrafish. <laughs> what, what, wouldn't that be nice? I, so I think fun, so we always think of paramecia as the one zebrafish food, um, but they're not, right? They, um, zebrafish eat anything that's the right size. Um, and as it so happens, uh, things that are the right size when you allow the zebrafish um, will scatter UV light. Right, so it's sort of it's, it's the basic physics of your body composition that makes that happen. So it, it's very difficult for those organisms to get rid of that property, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that um, the few organisms that are roughly of that size that are not really brighter than background in the UV, they're going to be darker than background in UV because they, 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 as soon as you have something like a cuticle, chitin, so things like that, um, you're black, you're UV black. Um, and then the fish see you because of that. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's cool. That uh, maybe maybe one more question, Jelka. Can we do one more? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, I'll sum up the the last two here. Um, it's about maybe you could talk about the evolution of horizontal cells and uh, maybe say something about uh, the appearance of their uh, spectral preferences. Ah, uh, yes. I think this is really interesting and something I certainly There must be four ancestral ones, which is the three that I've talked about plus the rod one. Okay. And chickens still have them. Um, zebrafish certainly have them. And then in the mammals, some mammals have two, number one and number two, and some mammals just have one. So for example, a mouse just has one and a ground squirrel has two. Um, so it kind of, and humans have two. So it seems, um, plus the rod one, I think. So three, sorry, I'm getting this mixed up. Um, so it seems that the early mammal ancestors that lost the green and the blue, the ancestral blue and green cone, they probably lost H3 along with it, the UV cone one. I don't know why, but they did. Um, that way, that would be the consistent explanation. And then, so you've got one and two left, and then you've got your mice, which also lost two, and your ground squirrels, which didn't, and your humans, which didn't, and many other species, which didn't. Mm -hmm. um, what's quite interesting is that um, I didn't really home in on this at all. If you look carefully at the UV con responses in the zebrafish, they are a little bit opponent. I sort of brushed over that. So they are green opponent against UV. Um, and this is something um, that could be potentially related to what we see in primates, which is that the blue cone, which is actually the UV cone, um, is a little bit yellow opponent because of, I think, H2. Mm -hmm. um, so the same horizontal cell mechanism seems to exist, but it's just a different color channel compared to the one that we that I've been discussing here. I see. You know, um, it actually kind of reminds me that there were I'm, I, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there were reports of um, kind of gap junctional coupling, right, between photoreceptors. I, I, in my mind, that's kind of more associated with uh, scotopic vision, that, that sort of thing. But how, yeah. how, would that, how would that kind of influence the mixing of colors? Does it happen in a type specific manner or? So as far as I know, and I'm gonna eat my words on this afterwards because I'm gonna have to look this up. <laughs> Yeah. They're mostly homotypic, okay. In the sense that red cones couple to red cones, etc. Um, uh -huh. I'm sure there's exceptions to that. Um, but um, what we found quite intriguing is that when we got rid of the horizontal cells, we didn't see any obvious spectral mixing between the cones, suggesting yeah. that at the light levels and at this developmental stage, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, heterotypic gap junctions in zebrafish don't do anything for this paradigm. Maybe they're doing something for timing, for intensity, for, you know. Um, what we did also do, uh, I didn't show this data, is we genetically ablated individual cone types, like ablate this one and see if this one changes. 
and we never saw anything at all um, once the horizontal cells are gone. Um, so it kind of looks like gap junctions didn't help. But also you should always, gap junctions always mix. You can't do clever opponency stuff with gap junctions, right? So maybe in order to keep cones separated, mixing them is, well, gap junctions are the wrong way to do that. Sure. Yeah. Okay, well, I think, um, I think we'll pause the, this part of the questions there, right, Jelica? Uh, thanks again for a wonderful talk, Tom. Well, and thanks I'll for having me here. I'll let Jelica say a few words uh, to close us out. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, Tom, fantastic talk. Everybody, I think, agrees that this was a perfect launching of the Next in Neuro um, webinar uh, series. And I hope you will be able to join us uh, some of the next time because we would like to, uh, to share with us um, some of your other work, not only scientific work, because you are very active in um, Friends in Africa. Um, so your nonprofit uh, organization, right? So I hope you will be able to join us uh, another time. And as a dog lover, I will have to ask you some question but this is after we finish this uh, after we finish this webinar. Well, thank you, thank you again, and yeah, I'd be I'd be very happy to talk about uh, trend in Africa as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, uh, and I hope to see you again in two or three months. Please follow our website, and we will update you with a new um, webinar. Thank you. <laughs>